This episode of Legends the Series is brought to you by Jags, offering you selection, value, and support. What is the most misunderstood part about you? Probably that I'm a tough, mean businessman. I welcome everybody to go and talk to my employees, and I think you'll find out a different story there. Uh, I'm competitive. I'm real direct. But go talk to one of my employees, or even numerous, or all of my ex-employees. Hopefully, I'm fair, very direct. If it's not happening, you know it, and I know it, and we're going to talk about it. I don't think I'm a hardcore, beat the guy up that works for me employer. And I think that's the, the part that's the most misunderstood about Don Schumacher. I've done just about everything you can do in one of these things. Rolled, burned, crashed, flew. Too many skeletons in the closet to, to really get into detail about that. But it was, a, it was a great life. You call it a rock star life. I call it a gypsy life. I mean, we wandered around this country. And everybody envisions what we do out here at at the races very different than what the reality is you call it rock star life sure i was successful did very well won a lot of races was making a lot of money everything was great but it was hard hard work i mean i'm serious we would run a match race and we would have already booked one 600 miles away because I always figured we could average 50 miles an hour going from that race to the next race. So we had 12 hours to get there. Get there, work on the car. Hopefully your truck didn't break down. Uh, did what you had to do. People may think rock stars are amazing or professional athletes are amazing and the life they have is great and fantastic. But the reality is it's different from the inside than it is from the outside. A lot of hard work. A lot of hard work today.
What seems to be the problem? You seem to be working frantically here. Oh, we got a little bit too much weight on the clutch, and it's pulling the motor down in the middle and burning some pistons out of it. Uh, that's why you changed the pistons, huh? That's right. We have changed four of them. <laughs> well, aside from the mechanical problem, how about the psychological problem going against young Billy Meyer? I'll take him on any day of the week. He's a... He's my hero right now because he's a good friend of mine. He's a very young man. He's doing a hell of a job, but I'll take him on any day of the week. Well, you won't have to wait any day of the week. It's coming up real soon. That's right. When I started racing, or the first time I went to a drag strip, I had never changed the oil in my car. Had no mechanical background. My father had no mechanical background. Had no interest in me doing anything. I, I, I mean... Uh, my mom and dad were the type of individuals that you can create your own destiny. They supported me when I started racing. They were probably one of the first families on the road with a Winnebago motorhome following me around the country to the different national races between all three associations, NHRA, IHRA, and AHRA. Loved making sandwiches for all of the teams and loved, you know, talking with all of the guys and that. But they were probably the, one of the first ones at the races with a motor home on the road. Uh, I got great support from them, uh, but they didn't push me into any of this. They didn't push me into Schumacher Electric. And I really believe sincerely that you really can't push your children into something. They have to decide that's what they want to do. Otherwise, they're not going to be very good at it. And that was the same thing. I, I think my folks realized that with me, undoubtedly. Uh, and they let me do what I chose to do. And it allowed me to be a driven, passionate individual with NHRA Drag Racing and our company, Schumacher Electric Corporation. So I, uh, they were right on, but they didn't push me and I don't push any of my children into what they choose to do. I have a son that, like I said, is the winningest top fuel driver in NHRA history. I have a daughter that has her PhD in molecular science. I have a daughter that's a doctor in Mission Viejo, California. And I have another daughter that just graduated grad school that is getting involved in both businesses. But that's going to be her decision, what she really wants to do. I'm not going to push her into taking over the drag racing company. I'm not going to push her into taking over Schumacher Electric. She will make her own decision. And fortunately, my father allowed me to make my own decision. Didn't talk me into getting out of the sport in 74. Didn't push me in the sport in the middle 60s. It was all my own decision and so I had nobody to pat on the back or kick in the behind but myself. I, undoubtedly I get some of my drive and dedication from my father. Uh, it just drove him nuts that I had enough parts and pieces to start a second team and why didn't I start a second team and then I had a second team why didn't I start a third team what the heck is going on here put somebody in the car and uh, my, my father was quite a driven individual that pushed me in that vein and uh, he al also pushed me to get out of the seat let somebody else drive that thing running down the road match racing uh, it was great. I mean, the, the accolades you received, the people you surrounded yourself with, the uniqueness of the life that you had was all great. But I had a wife and two children in the Chicagoland area. So it's not all peaches and cream then. It's not all peaches and cream today for all of us that are on the road as much as we are and as much as you are. It's a different life. Uh, be careful when you take your hobby that you love and you enjoy and wow, I'm a great baseball player in grade school and high school and college and all of a sudden you're in the, 
the major leagues. It's a whole different life and it changes your fun hobby to your work. Not as much fun any longer. not because there's no energy available. It's simply that we've called for more energy to be delivered to a given place than the line can take, and the whole system blows. The principle of the household fuse or circuit breaker, keeping supply and demand in near balance, can be extended to all forms of energy. All, in effect, have circuit breakers. And when the demand grows greater than the immediate supply, the circuits break. It was announced today that gasless Sundays will go into effect as of next month. And when several circuits break at the same time, we have an energy crisis. Well, you had to kind of work a deal with a gas station owner to fill that 150 gallon tank in the back of your pickup so you could get from one race to another race. Uh, there was rationing of gasoline, pricing of gasoline was going through the ceiling, but I mean there was flat an energy crisis to where you weren't certain that you could get down the road. So we all added gas tanks to our pickup trucks and we all got, you know, schmoozed a, a guy that owned a gas station and some people on the road and that, so we were able to get down the road. Uh, there was a lot of unsavory individuals that started to get involved in the sport to, to launder the, their income and such. And there were just a lot of things that were happening that I was involved in in 73, 74 that I said, I don't see the future here. I, I don't want to work this hard any longer. I'm in trouble at home with my wife and my kids. Uh, my father's business is not going anywhere. Uh, and I could see myself, if I stayed involved in the sport, I envisioned myself in getting into real, real trouble. So I, I just said, that's it, I, I'm done. I can remember running uh, the race at Indy getting beat by, I think, Billy Myers in the semifinal. Uh, and he ran against Perdome the next day in the final. And just kind of packing everything up, going back to Chicago and calling up in New Hampshire where I had a match race the following weekend or two week weekends later and just said, I'm done. Short line. And now, here comes John Shoemaker from Park Ridge, Illinois, known as Super Shoe won the national championship in 1970. Hopes to repeat here in the nationals in 1974. And Billy Meyer hopes to capture his very first national title. Waco Willie is his nickname. Did you have any regrets of walking away when you did? Anybody that was as involved in the sport as I was in 1974, to step away was a very painful, difficult decision to make. But it was made because of where the sport was at, where I felt it was going, my own personal family, wife and children, home, uh, business that uh, my father had that he had retired from. Uh, it was really a combination of everything and I was tired. I was running 95 to 100 match races a year traveling 600 miles between match races, be going down the road. I mean, if I go back to the late 60s, you're going down the road with one other guy in the truck. In the mid 70s, you're going down the road with two guys, yourself and two other guys. So uh, it was a thrash and a lot of work and a lot of personal dedication. Uh, in 73, I had a three car team uh, and it was just time for me to step away and catch my breath a little bit and think about what tomorrow was going to be. So it, it was difficult. It was very, very hard. I hated sitting behind a desk. 
I hated being at the office, but it was something I had to do. I had to take another step in my life. It's coming up right now, as a matter of fact, as Don Shoemaker eases his car to the line. Boy, what a moment of tension here. Everything has to be so right at that start, and Billy Myers gets a good start. He's got a half a car length lead now, a car length, now two cars, and he goes over, and the engine blows on Shoemaker's car as he crosses the finish line. Billy Meyer defeats Don Shoemaker in the semis of the funny car, and Shoemaker blows the engine at the line. Terrible mistake on my part of what I envisioned the sport was transitioning to versus what it has gone to today. I was wrong in what my feelings were and what my vision was back then versus where the sport has gone to today. This car is being driven by Tony Schumacher. His dad, Don, was one of the pioneers. Steve Evans probably used to book him in at one of those West Coast tracks. You won this race in 74. You beat the Ram Chargers, and you turned a blazing time of... Seven seconds flat at 218 miles an hour. It was actually 1970, not 1974. Think that kind of time will get you into the winner's circle here, kid? It could. You know, the track's changing, and uh, after the last pedaling job I did, Corey's been running real good, so, I, you know, if he goes up in smoke, it's going to be a battle. We've seen a 90 this weekend, and we've had some clutch problems. Uh, you know, a seven-second can win a race, but uh, with Corey running the other lane, I don't think this time. Don, you got to be really proud of the boy. I am very, very proud of him. I mean, God is with us, and that's all you can ask for. With everything that's gone on here this weekend, Tony's got one heck of a chance to win this race. As a rookie to win the Nationals, how could I be anything but proud? And he said it was 1970. It's funny, I didn't think he was that old to look at him. Tony didn't get into drag racing, you wouldn't be back here? That's for sure. I, I was done. I was, uh, I was enjoying life. I was enjoying uh, what I was doing. <sighs> I wouldn't be back here. I can say, I, I quickly say, yeah, I wouldn't be back here, but I also know the competitive passions that I have inside of me Ca would have caused me to do something. Uh, I love the sport. It's a unique family atmosphere out here. And I don't mean just my own personal family. I mean all of the other competitors, from whether it be Forrest, whether it be Coletta, whether it be Alan Johnson, whether it be the Torrances, whether it be the Lucases. Uh, I value very highly all of those family relationships that we have out here. Even with you, Bobby, I mean, uh, we have our moments that are good and bad, but bottom line, we're family to each other. We spend a lot of time in the same environment. That's just the reality. So, and that's very unique in this business. I haven't been involved in Major League Baseball or NFL or NBA or professional hockey. Maybe they have the same thing, but I feel we have a really unique relationship with each other out here, really unique environment that we care about each other greatly. And I value that tremendously. That's very different than Schumacher Electric and the competitors I have in that business. Not one of them could I consider a family member or somebody that I care about. And whether Perdome and I exchange Christmas cards or not, that doesn't matter. I consider him family, realistically. I spent a lot of time with him going down the road and I care greatly about Don, his wife, and his daughter. McEwen, uh, it was tearful when Jungle Jim lost his life, and Brutus, and Nicholson, and just kind of on and on. Spend a lot of time with those people that you get very close to them. And that's what 
creates the sport to be what it is. That's why it's so great to go out and beat your, the guy that's in the other lane or the lady that's in the other lane. Uh, it, it's an unusual environment that I stepped away from, enjoyed after a period of time. I mean, I hated it for six months or a year being away from the sport. And I had to really keep myself from going to the races and get involved in other things. I went to Indy every year. And God, I was glad when I left the pits and was driving back up north that I could pull that NHRA needle out of my arm and okay, I don't, I, I don't have to do this again, but I know I could go out there and beat every one of these guys. Uh, it, it's hard to say, to be real honest with you, if it wasn't for Tony that I wouldn't be back in the sport or I would. I blame Tony for me coming back out here and having seven teams and 140 employees and everything else that's operating out here in NHRA, but it's not his fault. I, I take full responsibility for what I do and the decision I, decisions I make. We exactly will have lane choice because we have been talking about that ourselves and trying to read the numbers on the monitor here. We'll get that for you as quickly as we can. Bob Fry, uh, Tony Schumacher has really been a story here this weekend. Yeah, his dad won this race back in the early 70s. He's one of the few kids that can get into a top fuel car. They said they slowed down. He used to race death. He's used to going way over 300. He'll need that to take out by son. I wanted Tony in a safe car. I wanted him in a competitive car. And it was time for me to get uh, behind that. It is a sad morning here at Indianapolis Raceway Park in the NHRA US Nationals. Yesterday, the drag racing sport lost a shining light. Top fuel points leader Blaine Johnson died of injuries, suffered in a 300 mile an hour finish line accident the race he comes in as the number 16 qualifier so that means that he would end up with a bye in round one and look at what he does what a fabulous salute by tony schumacher he did this on purpose this was planned when he rolled to the starting line this is a salute to our fallen champion blaine johnson and what a touching moment it was for all of us. Truly a class act. I, at my age, I spend more time with my children than I think 95% of the parents in this world. So I'm very blessed to be able to do that. Uh, do we spend a lot of time at the races, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and, and together at restaurants at night and such? No, I mean, Tony's got a full-time job out here. I have a full-time job out here. Uh, but it was, it, it's a real rewarding situation that I can spend this much time with my son. My daughters come out all the time. Megan, my youngest daughter, is out here all the time. I spend more time with my family at my age than what I believe 95% of the people and parents in this world do. regret letting the monster known as DSR get as big as it did? Wow, I, I'm, I'm a businessman and I believe there's two ways to go in this world and that's either up or down. Uh, it certainly is a monster. Uh, what will it be next year and the year after that? I don't know, but I, I intend to continue to grow and do more for the automotive industry, more for the NHRA sport, more for all of my sponsors, 
and I care more about my team members today, meaning my employees, than I ever have. I figure with the 140 employees I have at DSR, that's probably feeding and taking care of four to 500 people. I care greatly about those four or 500 people. I'm a driven individual that I want to win every world championship, I want to win every race. But really when I step back and I think about it, it's those four to 500 people that I care tremendously about and that probably drives me more today to keep this together and to keep it growing and keep it expanding. Mm -hmm. Probably the thing, thing that makes me most emotional is when I have to fire somebody. I hate it with a passion. I may have a good reason to discharge that person, but I think about his family, how it affects all of them. I hate that with a passion and I cry every time I have to. I love John Force. I mean, I'd do anything in the world for the guy and for his family and such. Uh, I've never hated John Force. I want to beat him at every race, every time he and one of my cars pull up to the starting line. I want to beat him in the worst way. He's the best funny car driver in the history of the sport, winningest funny car driver in the history of the sport. Uh, I come from funny car roots. Yes, my son drives a top fuel dragster. But as I've told John, and as I'll tell you, my heart is really more open to beating John Forrest for the world championship every year and at every race than it is Tony winning a race. I care greatly about my child and about the U.S. Army and that kind of stuff, but to go out and beat John Force, that's really a, an accomplishment. But I love the man. Uh, he's not happy with me right now, but that's his problem. Understand there's no hate to that relationship. It's strictly love on my part. Uh, I guess I'm a little different than most of the team owners out here, so there may not be as much love coming back towards me. Doesn't bother me. Uh, I'm a competitor, I'm a businessman, and you kind of put yourself out on your own little island when you choose to be in that environment. So we'll go forward from there, but I, uh, again, I, I care greatly about John Forrest, all of his children, his wife, uh, every employee that he has over there. Uh, I wish them nothing but the best. You ever heard the song by Tim McGraw, sure. Live Like You Were Dying? That's right. Yeah. How many times did that song play through your head? Plays through my head every day. You don't go around a bull named Fu Man too, <laughs> are you? <laughs> if I chose to, I would. I'd have no problem with doing that, jumping out of an airplane or, or any of those things. If that's what I wanted to do, and that really brought a piece of pleasure to my life, for however long I'm, I'm going to be on this earth for. Yeah. I'd be going for it. Uh, I'm that kind of person. A total, total shock. Uh, I knew I had a bump on my neck. Went to my GP. He felt it, moved it around, said, ah, it's nothing. It's don't, don't even worry yourself about it. If and when you have an MRI, have him do your neck also. Uh, mistake on his part. And fortunately,
Unfortunately, I had an executive physical planned at Mayo Clinic a month and a half after that date. I can't say that I even was impacted by cancer until being a few weeks in my radiation treatment. I'd say the end of January, the first of February is when that started to impact me and impacted me emotionally and had some real dark days uh, through the treatment and such. But that's really when the cancer thing kind of comes home. Uh, but the support that I received from family, friends, teammates, uh, and spectators around the sport of NHRA was able to carry me through those dark times. Uh, there was never a time that I, I said to myself, I can't do this anymore. There were some miserable, miserable times that said, boy, I don't want to do this. Uh, but I tend to be somebody that deals with things, and if, uh, if there would have been that time, I would have found some way to deal with it. Uh, unfortunately, I talked to a man that I had never met, and I still haven't met him, and I met him through the Infinite Hero Foundation, uh, a guy that had been treated for tongue cancer and lymph node in the neck also. Uh, and he was treated down at MD Anderson, and he's really the one that gave me, got to make a decision, you're going to live or die. And once you focus on that, it changes your whole feelings at that time. At least it changed mine at that time. It uh, really impacted me and uh, allowed me to step out of that woe is me uh, situation. Once you have cancer, you are never through with it. It is in your mind every second of every day. It haunts you. It's a terrible, terrible disease very, very hard on you, mentally and emotionally, and until you have cancer, you really don't understand that, because you say, oh, okay, you got through the treatment, and now you can just go on with your life. I wish it was that way, and I wish nobody ever had to experience cancer, because once you have it, it's at the tip of your mind, right out front, every second of your life. Make the decision as early as you can that you're going to live or die. And I think the decision is very easy. It's going to be tough. Uh, there's going to be some real tough, dark days. Uh, but you'll get through it. And that's one thing that all of the doctors said and all of the the nurses is, you'll get through this. It's going to be tough. And each person's body reacts differently to these treatments. Uh, and I really believe here in the next five years, they're going to have a remarkable change in the way they treat this disease. Certain, not just my type of cancer, but all kinds of cancers. Uh, and I, I really look forward to the medical industry accomplishing that because it's it's kind of a barbaric treatment today still. Uh, that, that's the hardest part. I mean, what I, what I put my kids, uh, especially Megan being the youngest, and what I put Sarah through, uh, I apologize to them constantly wasn't a disease I brought on myself. Uh, I believe everybody has cancer running through their body and it's just when that cell starts to mutate, which isn't in your control. Uh, but me coming down with this disease tremendously impacted uh, all four of my children 
and certainly my wife tremendously, and I know my friends and teammates and, and everybody else. Uh, uh, it was a very, very humbling situation, and, and what I did to them, all I can do is apologize to them yesterday and today and tomorrow, because uh, it continues to impact them. Some people are going to remember me as a negative, some people are going to remember me as a positive. The ones that I, I care about remembering me are the ones that I love and they love me. And that goes beyond just my family, it goes to my friends, uh, it goes to a lot of my teammates, uh, the people that you reach out and you touch all the time. Uh, they'll remember me for what I am. And I don't think that there's a neg negative thought in any one of those people's minds or feelings. So uh, I don't worry myself about it. And as I said at that time, I'm going to be gone. So how can I worry myself about it? You love a lot more people a lot deeper. Uh, you want to enjoy life more than work at life. Uh, in all of those ways that, that you can reach out and enjoy and take care of things. Uh, I'm a businessman. Uh, I'll always be a businessman even through this treatment and through having cancer. But the almighty dollar doesn't mean as much to me any longer. And that comes with being 70 years old and everything else, but uh, cancer certainly changed me in that vein. And uh, taking care of the people around me is a lot more important today than it was prior to my cancer.